Hello all sentient beings and welcome to Transmissions Alt Mode, where we talk all news, comics, and media related to the... On this episode of Transmissions Alt Mode, we review Transformers Optimus Prime issue 22. The 1986 Transformers The Movie gets listed on 300 additional screens, and we check out the official promo video for the Transformers Arcade Shadow Rising. Today is Friday, September 7th, 2018, and this is episode 93 of Transmissions Alt Mode. Welcome to Transmissions Alt Mode, the podcast that has another previously published podcast take place in the middle of this one. I'm your host, Charles, a.k.a. Big C, and I'm joined by the excellent Transmissions team. Yusuf, better known as Yoshi. Yo! And Jeremy, a.k.a. Yakko. Hey, how you doing? Let's talk Transformers. She had one fucking job. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> Mother of... <laughs> Mother of fuck. Okay. <laughs> All right. I think a little bit of you Russian Yoshi snuck, snuck in there. <laughs> <laughs> well, Yoshi, keep your swear words handy because I got to tell you, there's no new Donatrions this week. Sorry. <sighs> it's my fault, really. I'm not on every single episode. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Yeah. But- but uh, to to offset the lack of Yoshi, we're running another contest. So if you want to win a G1 reissue, Starscream, Devastator, or Bumblebee, just sign up and become a Donatrion by September 30th. You go to transmissionspodcast.com slash support, and that's where you can sign up on PayPal or Patreon, whichever you prefer. Can we call this you don't have to go to Walmart contest? <laughs> okay. okay, sure. Fine, executive decision made. <laughs> all right and uh we also have another episode of transmissions declassified it just came out uh last week uh just under the wire at the end of august so this was the august declassified daryl led this one this was all about fixing modding cleaning and caring for your transformers figures and daryl was joined by chris aka Vangelis from wtf at tfw and Steven, a.k.a. Echo TF. It's a good listen. Good long, long podcast. So you got, <laughs> you, if you got a long car ride, put that on. Just enjoy that good discussion. Do we have a clip? I think we do. Let's play a clip. And uh, again, you can get it at a lot of hobby stores. A lot mm-hmm. of the, like, the real pro model builders use it. And I, as I remember correctly, Jared did some of that. I think it might have been on his MP Prowl or something. Anyways, highly so recommend what, people check it out if they want the real Chrome. So I got I got a thing that I've looked into and I, I've I've messed with a bit. Um, I learned this actually from Tested. Uh, it's called Molotow Liquid Chrome. That's what I was going to say. I actually am am holding a bottle of it right now. Yeah, it, it is it is a, an ink. They have a spray on version too. And and the reason they started selling pens is people were taking the stuff that was meant to go in an airbrush to be sprayed on, and it's like painting it on um the community who has the biggest knowledge about molotow liquid chrome is the uh prop community all right if you want to hear the rest of that discussion all you got to do is head over to our patreon page and become a donatron you can get the whole podcast all right let's move on and start off with some comics news all right so we've got a couple of covers for upcoming comics. So looks like Star Trek versus Transformers number one is right around the corner. It should be out, uh, according to the solicits, should be out next week, September 12th. And we've got the retailer incentive cover featuring the cats. We've got Ravage versus uh, Officer Emress. And this is art by Paulina Ganucho, I hope. (laughs) <laughs> that's right <laughs> but yeah it's a it's a good cover i like it mm-hmm. so we're looking forward to star trek versus transformers looking forward to how that's going to go through one issue i have with this because it's supposed to be the animated versions of both mm-hmm. that decepticon logo on ravage is too perfect for the original 80s animation style <laughs> well mres is in quite a 
uh, dynamic pose as well. Mm-hmm. I don't I don't think the the animated Star Trek characters could move quite that uh, acrobatically. Yeah. But just just imagine it's a <laughs> poorly done animation <laughs> as you're reading the comic. All right, another cover we have is Lost Light number 24. Uh, this is a Jeff Sr. cover, and it's homaging one of Jeff Sr.'s other covers from way back in the uh, Transformers UK, issue number 113. So uh, this cover has Rung in the same pose that Rodimus Prime had in that classic issue. And for anyone who follows the work of James Roberts, you would know that issue 113 was the first issue of Transformers that James Roberts got, and he works in the number 113 into all of his, of his fiction. Uh, and in the TFW story, you can see the comparison between the uh, the Lost Light cover and the original artwork. Always nice to see more Jeff Sr. Mm-hmm. And the last uh, cover image we have is for Optimus Prime number 25. And this one is by Andrew Griffith. And he tried to work in all the characters from both Robots in Disguise and Optimus Prime. Uh, and it's a it's a cool image. I like it. Got Thundercracker and Buster, Marissa Fairborn, Metal Hawk. That's a blast from the past. Uh, the Combiners, Devastator, Victorian. Got Prowl, Starscream, Bumblebee. Uh, RC is there. Yep, and of course Optimus Prime, right in the center. What is going on with like the? I guess the the new Optimus Prime Evergreen design that Hasbro is pushing for everyone. Like those windshield wipers are super prominent. That's the same in the Cyberverse cartoon too. Like why, why are, why are we have such emphasis on his windshield wipers? The chest always got, it brings in the audience. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) (laughs) Me Grimlock know all about wipers. What do your good part of story? All right. (laughs) Moving on. We've got a fan-made animated trailer for the Lost Light series finale. And this is something that James Roberts himself was promoting on Twitter. So uh, I thought I'd put it in the chat here. Uh, So if you guys want to check that out, uh, it's a cute little animation. uh, Some of the voices didn't match what I had like in my head for some of the characters. But, (laughs) I mean, it was good animation-wise. It was really great for, you know, fan thing and much better than than the combiner wars trilogy (laughs) and uh in the uh the voice cast chris mcfeely is the voice of megatron so if you guys might remember he did a couple of other audio projects where he voiced megatron and good friend of the show marion is uh first aid in this video so check it out all right uh so that's all for comics news And let's get into our comic review. Transmissions wouldn't be what it is today without the awesome support of our listeners. If you'd like to support our shows and enjoy the exclusive benefits that our donors get, please visit transmissionspodcast.com slash support. This week we are doing Optimus Prime number 22, Unstopped and Unstoppable. Written by John Barber, art by Sarah Peter Duoche. Colors by Josh Burcham, letters by Tom B. Long, editor David Marriott, and publisher Greg Goldstein. Okay, we have three covers. Uh, Cover A is by Kay Zama with colors by Josh Burcham. It's uh, Optimus Prime and Bumblebee with Shockwave and Unicron in the background. Cover B is by Sarah Peter Duoche. It features Rom and Jazz. And then the retailer incentive cover is the line art for cover A by K Zaba. So without Josh's colors. So uh, Jeremy, which cover are you picking? I am picking, I think, just cover A. Mm-hmm. It, I mean, it really tells you kind of what's going on in the story, just kind of in a single image. I, I like cover B, but it just seems a little bit too happy for, you know, kind of the mood of, of what's going on mm-hmm. but yeah i mean cover a and then if i could ever get that ri cover i would cool yoshi uh which cover are you picking sarah peter do cover won me over really quick it's it's got that 
I guess the kids are calling it what vapor wave aesthetic to it. I kind of dig it. Mm -hmm. It's the colors that are, that are winning me over. Cool. How about you, Charles? What are you choosing this week? Or are you going to pull a Sheldon? No, don't do that anymore. (laughs) Uh, Cover a cover. Uh, Yeah. I I like the Kazama cover. I like the colors that Josh Burcham put on there and yeah, I just think it's cool. Well, I see we can't agree on anything. (laughs) <laughs> yep. <laughs> let's keep going. <laughs> All right. So uh, let's uh, get into the story and then we'll uh, talk about our thoughts at the end. So the story starts off with Optimus Prime dreaming, or is he? In this vision, he sees that the dark Cybertron prophecy was about himself. And all he's ever done is bring chaos and destruction where he, tr- where he tried to bring peace. He brings about the end for himself and all he ever cared about. But it was just a dream, or maybe a nightmare. He awakens with a scream to find Wheeljack standing in front of him. Wheeljack welcomes him back to the land of the living. He used science and raw materials from the hotspot inside the Titan Trypticon to build new sparks and bodies for both Optimus and Bumblebee. Then he downloaded their pure information essences into their new bodies from Pyramagna's mind, where they were housed when they escaped from the limbo of infraspace. So Shockwave was captured, Liege Maximo was killed, the Maximals were driven away, and Optimus Prime and Bumblebee are back. All's well that ends well. Except there's a new problem, as Windblade explains. Recently, Cybertron lost contact with the colony world Velocitron. A team led by Cliffjumper went through the space bridge to investigate, but they never returned. The last image sent back appears to show a large object in the sky above Velocitron attacking the planet. Windblade shows this final image to Optimus Prime and explains further. While he was offline, the visionary's magical artifact, the talisman, awoke and spoke a word. Unicron. The uncreator, Primus's opposite, is coming. Meanwhile, on Earth, Rom has run afoul of some humans using illegally procured Cybertronian weapons. Rom doesn't want to hurt the humans and tries to reason with them, but the humans see Rom as just another alien robot invading their planet. As things heat up, Lone Wolf Autobot Jazz appears and steps in to lend Rom a hand. He's been busy tracking down Cybertronian weapons while he's been a fugitive from Earth justice. While Jazz helps Rom dispose of the Cybertronian tech, Rom has a massive flash of pain. He's received an urgent distress signal from his home planet, Elonia. Something threatens his world, and he needs to get there now, but Rom doesn't have access to a starship that will get him there in time. But Jazz might have another option. At the same time, out in deep space, former Soul Star Knight and current Cybertronian slash Dire Wraith hybrid, Star Drive, also receives the distress signal from Elonia. She wants to go there immediately, but she's currently working with Prowl and his team of renegades, and they've got a different mission. They've been tracking the Maximal ship and its path of destruction across the galaxy, and now that they just attacked Cybertron, they've got to figure out what their end goal is. All other concerns have to take a back seat. On Earth, Trypticon has made its new home in the neighborhood of Mount Rushmore. As Slug and Trypticon share a quiet moment standing watch, the President of the United States has a not-so-quiet moment with Marissa Fairborn. Earth's delegate to Cybertron. The president is not pleased that Trypticon, Earth's Cybertronian embassy, is squatting on U.S. soil. She doesn't want another force of invading Cybertronians pouring out of the giant robot dinosaur space bridge. Marissa protests that she gives her guarantee that won't happen, but the president isn't convinced. But their conversation is interrupted by Jazz, who's just arrived with Rom. Marissa is ready for a fight, but Jazz is only here to talk and hopefully get Rom a ride on Trypticon Space Bridge to Cybertron, and from there, passage to Elonia. The president demands Jazz surrender, which he gives as long as he can get Rom a trip home. Elsewhere on the Bikini Atoll, currently home to the Junkions, Sharkticons, and Optimus Prime's new recruits from the Colony Worlds, they get word of Jazz's capture by the humans. Division colonist Slide sees this as another failure of Optimus Prime's leadership, and she's ready to take matters into her own hands. Meanwhile, Rom makes his way to Cybertron, and he, Optimus, Bumblebee, and crew take the Arc Zero ship to Elonia. 
Now, this is where you have to insert Unicron number zero, the free comic book day comic. So go read that comic and then come back and read the rest of Optimus Prime number 22. So, you know, uh, if you remember what happens there, everyone went to Alonia. Unicron was there. He was eating the planet. They tried to save as many Elonian citizens as they could. They got about, what, a third of the population, two-thirds of the population, back to Cybertron, and Unicron ate Elonia. In the aftermath of Elonia's destruction, Rom is devastated, sitting dejectedly on Optimus Prime's shoulder aboard the Ark Zero. Prime tries to console him, but there's not much anyone can say. RC is ready to fight and points out that they need to figure out a way to stop Unicron before it consumes another world. At this point, Pyramagna reveals that she might have an option. She's secretly been in contact with a renegade Cybertronian who's been tracking the Maximals as they've, as they've been attacking Cybertronian outposts throughout the galaxy. Optimus angrily asks why she didn't warn them about the Maximals attacking Cybertron, but she claims they didn't know that was their target. Prime still demands to know why she didn't tell him, and the reason is clear when she reveals who her contact is, Prowl. Pyromagna opens a comm channel and Prowl's holographic avatar appears in her hand. Prowl, out in deep space hunting Maximals, greets Prime warmly. Despite their recent falling out, he's still glad to see him. As Prowl explains that he believes the Maximals have another role to play in Shockwave's schemes, Stardrive breaks in to ask what happened to Elonia. Sadly, Prime tells her, much to her despair. Unicron got Elonia, just like it got the colony world's Velocitron, and now Eucharis. And unfortunately, the Maximals have led Prowl's team to Unicron's next target, the Cybertronian colony, Division. Now that Unicron's next feast has begun, the Maximals leave. Prowl wants to follow them so they can get a step ahead of Unicron and lay a trap at the next target. But that means sacrificing the millions of lives on Division without a fight. Stardrive is disgusted with abandoning so many to their fate. Prowl says it's the logical thing to do. And sadly, as Division is consumed, Prime silently agrees. Prowl tracks the Maximal army to Caminus, and it's clear that will be Unicron's next target. RC has the Arc Zero fueled up and ready, and the rest of the Autobot fleet is ready to go. But Unicron is now seven times the mass of Cybertron. How can they possibly hope to stop it? Prime tells them he has a plan to save the citizens of Caminus and hopefully stop Unicron, but they won't like it. Spoiler, it didn't work, and Caminus was destroyed in Unicron number one, which we reviewed a couple of months ago. On Cybertron, Starscream has gathered the remnants of the Decepticons in the dead body of Metro Titan. He tells his followers he's got contacts with other Decepticon forces off-world that he can rally and form a resurgent Decepticon movement but his loyal troops are less than convinced. As Starscream tries to motivate his few remaining Decepticon followers, they get an unlikely visitor, Rhinox, a maximal spy left on Cybertron and still loyal to Shockwave, invites Starscream for a quick chat with his master in his prison cell. And they'll eventually have that in Unicron number two. On Earth, Slide and the other colonists get the devastating news feed from Circuit on Cybertron. All their homeworlds, Eucharis, Velocitron, Division, are gone. And Caminus is next. For Slide, this is the last straw. Optimus Prime and Windblade let all their worlds die, and they're going to let Caminus die as well. Midnight Express objects that Prime wouldn't do that, but Slide got word directly from Pyromagna that Optimus Prime's plan is to sacrifice Caminus. Slide declares she's done following the Prime and is ready for a revolution to be continued. So this is kind of a uh, get everything in order before Unicron. Uh, this book, uh, I believe this was a little bit late. This was like came out mid-July. It was supposed to come out before Unicron number one. That didn't happen. So it's a little bit disjointed to read this one after we've already read like Unicron one and two uh, at this point, uh, you know, three and four are already out. So uh, also uh, <laughs> a lot of people called out the uh, kind of weirdness that the few, the free comic book day uh, Unicron number zero issue basically takes place in the middle of this issue. And uh, we, uh, we got a particular comment from uh Anthony over at tfu.info. Uh, he particularly asked us 
Uh, for the next alt mode, can you guys please call out the BS? It is that Unicron number zero happens in between pages in the middle of Optimus Prime 22. The pages before really needed a continued after Unicron number zero in the lower right corner. And yeah, don't disagree. Yeah, I think in particular, an, an event like this needs the the call outs. Like for every everything it references should have a little box that says like seen in whatever issue. It, on yeah. this and on the Unicron side when they reference something. Yeah, I mean, IDW has, has been really bad about, like, helping the reader figure out the right reading order. I mean, this, mm-hmm. this they've pretty much left it all to Chris McFeely in the wiki <laughs> to figure it out. Yeah, but other other than that, so the art, I, so Sarah Peter Drew O'Shea, I think, did a great job in the art. Also, the colors with Josh Burcham. Uh, I think really highlight how much of atmosphere colors bring to an issue. Because if you compare this art with like an issue of Till Aller One, where Sarah also does the art in Till Aller One, but she's colored by uh, either Priscilla Tramontano or Joanna LaFuente, and it's much more kind of traditionally bright, uh, you know, colors and not the muted shaded G two esque look that uh, that Josh does. Mm-hmm. So it's really interesting to see Sarah's work get colored by Josh in this book. I thought it was uh, it was really nice, and it, it really keeps it consistent with the Optimus Prime uh, comic look. That that Josh's color style is really the the hallmark of the Optimus Prime comic. I think top marks for the art, the story. I still feel like it's you know it's pretty much. I mean, still kind of a mess. It's like pretty much a cleanup issue to to bridge the gap between the falling and Unicron, but it, and it's just all over the place. You know, it's just so many different things going on. And, you know, and then the fact that you have another whole comic taking place in the middle of this comic. So it's just a little, you know, a little frustrating for me. So uh, Yoshi, what are your thoughts? Well, they don't disagree with yours. I think first, there's probably thousands of listeners who are going to be grateful for your review and explaining uh, that two books are slammed in the middle of this, which just emphasizes that this was a poorly conceived and executed issue. Uh, This has got, let's get to the end as quick as possible, written all over it. I I, I don't know. Um, I think, I think fans who are, who are really entrenched in, in this universe uh, like it, like, like everything that's being put out at them. And I understand that. I don't think anybody else feels that way. (laughs) I'll be honest with you. The art is the only thing that kept me turning the page. I felt that I'm kind of all over the place with this. I felt like, let's start from the beginning. The roll call was a poorly utilized page. Uh, I felt that, uh, when Bumblebee makes his entrance, there was a missed opportunity for a fantastic joke. I couldn't wait for Optimus Prime to quit talking when he was on the page because I they just for a guy who's got a book uh, titled after him he's the least interesting character. What was the joke that you think they should have made for Bumblebee? All right, so uh, at the bottom left panel, Bumblebee says, "Listen, thanks for pulling me out of out of their prime. Usually, I don't know. Let me blow this up so I can see it. I don't know where I'd be without you." This time, I know exactly where, and it sucked because it was a black hole. Get it? And then Prime should have said, Bumblebee, during the war, even before you were the, the conscience of the Autobots, that joke was old. <laughs> I just, I, I felt that that, that, could have, that could have been like, okay, this is the issue where fucking Optimus Prime turns around, but it's not. I'm not, I'm not dinging, uh, Barbara wrote this, right? It feels mm-hmm. like Barbara. Yeah, like I'm not, I'm not dinging his writing ability. I think Optimus Prime, when the the book first came out, was filled with good intentions, and now they're forced to cram all this into an ending, just like they had to with uh, um, they had the whole Combiner Wars bullshit, and then they had to retcon fucking a Hasbro verse. I mean, they just leave these fuckers alone, Hasbro. Let them do what they do, and you build fucking toys. I just, I don't, I don't, I don't really blame IDW, Hasbro. This is just mandated end it and reboot it and i I, want to be i want to i'm sorry i want to be more eloquent about this like i I, it's just painful just put the take the horse out back already i'll shut up now 
separating this from the Unicron series, I, I was, you know, I was liking where Unicron was going, at least the, you know, at this point, uh, I've read up to issue four, uh, that's come out, you know, Unicron's been, been pretty good. It just feels like the Optimus Prime series is kind of just getting, I guess the, <laughs> there's, there's not enough meat left in the story for, you know, for Optimus Prime as, you know, maybe like the Unicron storyline should have just been the final arc of Optimus Prime instead of having a separate mini series. Cause the art is the only thing for me, for me, uh, that kept me mm-hmm. turning the page. The next, how many issues are left? Two, three, uh, three, 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 take those three issues, rework them, cut out all the dialogue, remove all the text, just make a beautiful book uh, with everybody doing what they can and Unicron devouring everything. That would be a less painful ending than what the fuck they're trying to sow here. Well, that's half of what's happening in Unicron right now. Is it? Well, <laughs> lots of things getting eaten, yes. and Yeah, but, you know, I mean, just cut out the fucking dial. Just let it let it happen. <laughs> Just just make it beautiful. Just make it a beautiful disaster on page and, and get it over with. All right, Jeremy, what were your thoughts? I agree with a lot of your criticisms. Um, the art was fantastic. The um, colors were fantastic. The story was all over the place, like you said. And also, I was just flipping through again and I noticed something. When Wimblade is mentioning the about the talisman, because actually this says there's three books because it also had the whole Transformers versus, versus Visionaries series apparently happened while Optimus was unconscious. But they oh, have yeah, a call. that's right. Yeah, they have yeah. a call out here. See Transformers versus Visionaries. Mm-hmm. That should have been done at all the other references. Why do it in one and not the other? I mean, this is on the editing because that's where that call should be made. And also something that's been bugging me for a while. But, I mean, you have the roll call page with pictures and each character's name, which is great. I like that. But then each time one of these characters shows up for the first time, you get a call out as well. I mean, one or the other, it, you don't need both. You know, I know he wants to do his little jokes like Wheeljack Mad Scientist. So, so just skip the roll call page altogether and just do the call outs. We do have a, a like, a. it's a very... It's hard to see, but on the page right after, like when Rom's sitting on Prime's shoulder, you do have that C Transformers Unicron FCBD. So it's there. It's hard to it's hard to spot, but it's there. But I don't think that I think it should have been a little bit a little bit more prominent. Yeah, I mean, really, there there should be a mapped out reading order. I think mm-hmm. you know you like some like you get checklists sometimes. There should there should be like a chronology, you know, it's like, you know, read these pages of this book and then Unicron Free Comic Book Day and then the rest of that book. And yeah, but I'm, I'm just I'm hoping that like th- this is like taking so many plot lines, trying to get everything to a single point so they can finish up. So I'm hoping that the, the rest of the series kind of is more linear and wraps things up a little bit better. I just I wanted to point this out because this this bugged me when I was reading it too. The the page where Jazz transforms in front of Melissa Fairborn, mm-hmm. the fucking wisps around him. Like I I immediately thought, why is the Black Cancer from X Files attacking Jazz? <laughs> I mean, we've got decades of example art of how you how you draw a transforming transformer. What what the hell is this? I don't know. And it's not really, it's never been like, it's not used anywhere else. I don't know where that came from. I kind of want this to be a thing now because it's so out of place. Maybe it's an art error. Like it's a significant error. I don't know. That's, that was weird. I mean, I thought it was cool. We we get to see something transform, but it's like, God, I mean, it look, it looks like she shot him with some kind of like tentacle monster gun or something. (laughs) And he's about to be, like Isn't that what the Wraiths did? Something. Didn't the Wraiths have a wispiness about them like that? That Rom was dealing with? It was more like physical tentacles sprouting mm. out of things, you know? This is really weird. It's on page 18 for anybody who gives a shit. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. It's I, I, I want to applaud you, though. That was not an easy review. You, you, you excelled, sir. <laughs> Thanks. All right. Well, uh, I guess if that's if that's all our thoughts, 
we'll wrap it up. Optimus Prime number 22. And we uh, I, we just got three more issues coming out this week for 23, Lost Light 23, Optimus Prime 23, and Unicron number four. So we've still got a backlog. <laughs> Our backlog was instantly refreshed this week. So look forward to more reviews <laughs> in the next month or so. All right, let's uh, move on to some Transformers media news. First up, we have some concept art from the last night. Uh, in particularly, in, in particular, you have a Cybertron. Uh, you you can see like the concept uh, drawing art, and then there's a little animation of the three D modeling of that. And I thought that was pretty interesting. And then you have some more just kind of painted concept art. And then um, one of the things I like is like some of the posters and. And, um, and paintings and stuff like when you see like George Washington and there's a transformer in there, you can see those paintings in a little bit better detail than you saw in the movie. So, uh, and then you get a lot of the weapon designs, swords and, and whatnot. So that was, just, you know, regardless of what you think about the movie, some of the stuff is, is pretty neat. Next up, uh, we have a promo video for the Transformer Shadow Rising arcade game. And I, I watched it and it it's just going through kind of the game mechanics and everything. If you're interested in the game, check it out. It I it didn't do anything that would make me more interested in playing the game personally. Yeah. I mean, for just it, what? Four thousand dollars? <laughs> It's yeah. it's particularly very sales pitchy. So it's more if you if you are running a Dave and Buster <laughs> Yeah, it's targeted towards an arcade. Yeah. If you're if you're running a Dave and Buster's Maybe this will entice you to buy it. It could have used a more dynamic announcer. It, it was a very bland announcer. And the folks playing the game, they they were not too excited. Yeah. It's called acting, Charles. Brilliant. <laughs> not good acting. Bully. All right, moving on to the Bumblebee movie. We have um, reports that movie theaters are getting the... Uh, the promo cardboard standees, and one person said that uh, this it's a, a 14 foot high and eight foot wide cardboard cutout, and we actually have an image here of that cardboard cutout. Uh, the eyes light up, and it's a a pretty impressive big um, you know piece of of promo. Yeah, looks cool. It's one of those that'll take up a large portion of the the entrance to your theater. Maybe they'll they'll have them up, uh, you know, when we go to see the 86 movie in a few weeks. Next, we have a uh, word from uh, the actor himself. David Sobolov is going to be playing Blitzwing in the movie. You mean Starscream? Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, if you recognize the name and can't really place it, he was Depth Charge in Teletran 1 and Beast Wars. It was Shockwave and the generic Viacon voice in Transformers Prime. And he's currently playing Gorilla Grodd in the Flash and Legends of Tomorrow TV shows. He's got a nice deep voice. And you know, regardless of what you think about the Starscream Blitzwing thing, he's a great voice actor that's done Transformers work in the past. So, you know, I'm pretty confident he'll do a good job. Have they, have they had the balls to explain the Starscream Blitzwing thing yet? Nope. Okay. Travis Knight at San Diego gave some kind of, um, I can't remember what he said. It was something about he wanted the triple changer. I mean, he actually knew about triple changers and stuff, but. Not their color scheme. Yeah. I mean, there's been no real explanation on like the color scheme and how this face screams star scream. Star I mean, scream. It, I mean, looking at I this think... picture here, that's just like a screen cap. It's just. It's it's Starscream. I don't think we even have confirmation that he's a triple changer. We have no, no we, we do. The, uh, we do. I'm pretty sure. We, I mean, we know the other Decepticons in the movie are triple changers, but they haven't said this well, I mean, one yet. I thought they had. This but, could be. I'll give him the benefit of the doubt. This could be a giant troll. Wait, I mean, wait. I I don't know about you guys, but especially with the recent Marvel movies, they've they've been showing different uh, renderings of the trailer than the final product. That's true. I mean, but... It could be the whole con thing in Star Trek, like the second J.J. Abrams movie. So who knows? But 
regardless, it's a good voice actor. He's done Transformers mm-hmm. work in the past, and so I, I'm glad that they're they're getting you know voice actors, not just you know generic celebrities celebrities to do these voices. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Congratulations, right. David Sobolov. Yes. We look forward to your version of Starscream soon. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. I'm moving on to the 86 movie that is going to be coming back to the theaters. Like I recently mentioned, um, they have had such a um, high demand. They have added 300 more theaters in the U S. So if you haven't been able to get a ticket in your area, check again um, on the fathom events site or your, your um, whatever your preferred theater is. And also I'm sure Daryl and DJ Ronan and dog Kate and all of our Canadian listeners will be happy to know. They have announced that Canada is also going to get it a couple days later. Uh, instead of September 27th in the U S it's going to be September 30th in Canada. So go to fathomevents.com and find out where it's going to be showing. I, I've heard that Ontario is getting a, a significant number of them. So, you know, that's good for a number of our listeners. This is like Hasbro's worst nightmare. I know. It's like trying well, to get all this excitement over the Bumblebee movie, and then this like one night only thing is probably going to make more money. Yeah, it, <laughs> I, I'm wondering if it's going to make more money than the whole Justice League run in theaters, which like you know Infinity War did within a week. Uh, I'm thinking this movie might be able to do it too. You guys got your tickets, right? Oh yeah, I was the first one in, in my theater because like, <laughs> like I had my pick of any seat in the theater, and I got like dead nice. center. I don't think there it's possible to make that much money just because they've limited the oh. theater so much and it's one showing. So I guess they might max out. Like if they sell out all their tickets, like in every theater, that'll be good. I mean, maybe that'll convince them to, to, to show it again, but maybe the one night only could be eh, one night every year. <laughs> they ought to do is also let you buy the Blu-ray as you walk out of the theater. And <laughs> and just to add that to the total sales so that somebody at, at Hasbro marketing is like, oh, fuck. What they need to do is talk to our friend Jimmers and get, you know, special copies of Respect the Prime. But it's a little too late for that. But I, I will be wearing my Respect the Prime shirt that night. And uh, we, you know, in addition to the movie, we're getting, there's going to be a, a preview of Bumblebee and then also some Stan Bush, um, I think it, like an interview and some recent um, like footage of him doing some of the songs. Did I read that Canada's getting a second screening too? No, their, their oh. screening is going to be a couple of days after ours. Gotcha. So, you know, if you see it in the U S and you have Canadian friends, no spoilers for the 30 year old movie. <laughs> 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 so anyway, that is uh, the update on a six movie. And now let's talk about Cyberverse for a minute. We have a premiere date for Canada. It it will be September 16th. Uh, It premiered this past weekend in the U.S. on Cartoon Network. It will be on Teletoon at 1.30 p.m. September 16th in Canada. Essentially, that is the Robots in the Skies time slot. And um, we also have titles for episodes one to five. Uh, one and two have already aired in the U.S., and that is Fractured and Memory. Episode three is All Spark. Episode four is The Journey. Episode five is Wide Out. And essentially, it's one episode a week from here on out. And um, we have descriptions here. We'll just have that in the show notes in case you don't want to have any spoilers at all. And um, I guess we can take this time right now to to talk about the, the first episode. And it... Basically, we we start out with Bumblebee, and apparently his memory is completely gone. And Windblade shows up and tries to to help him. Um, I thought the animation style was not nearly as bad as I was expecting. It, I mean, it, it has its own style to it, and and I judged everything now in relationship to the Mission of the ser- series, so nothing can be that bad. <laughs> But I had seen work from the studio before with the Danger Mouse series, and you know, I liked it. It was a kind of a two D, three D mix, uh, cell shaded. It was, I think, for the 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 real target demographic. I think it'll go over pretty well. Uh, I, what do you guys think of of the show so far? 
So oh, I was. <laughs> I thought it was good. I enjoyed it. I mean, I thought for. I mean, there are a lot of constraints put on it. I mean, one that it's it's a fifteen minute or actually eleven minute cartoon instead of a twenty two minute half hour show. I felt like the people behind this cartoon. So I guess it's Boulder Media. They're a studio out of Ireland, I believe. So I feel like these people must have some connection to like the old UK Transformers comics because it seems like at least, and I, I've watched the first two episodes, but like, it seems like they have been, and they are familiar with the IDW comics too, as well. I think that they are mm-hmm. dropping a lot of comics references into these shows and it feels like they've actually put some work into the lore behind the show. Uh, and you know, it looks like they're going to explore that in each episode through this this the plot device of Bumblebee losing his memory and then having to, you know, get his memories back. So that part I like. I like Windblade being the central character. I think uh, um, it's cool to see her as like uh, being the main driving force in the story. We saw the Decepticons show up. I guess I, I'm I'm blending in the first two episodes, but I I just think. Uh, and the first two episodes are really make pretty much make one half hour show, at least, you know, the way the way it goes. I wouldn't be surprised if that's how it goes, which is, yeah, if you're going to do that, why not make one 30 minute show? Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I enjoyed it and I and I think it's got a lot of potential. I mean, there are some aesthetic things like the animation, everything I think is is fine and good. I I, I don't think there's any issues with that. The aesthetic things and the choices you know in terms of uh optimus prime having a mouth and bumblebee having to talk through the radio that's that's the kind of stuff that's like okay i get it that's what the kids think of prime and bumblebee these days but in episode two you do get to see in his mindscape he does talk no yeah i but but i see that as kind of a compromise it's like in in real world he has to talk through the radio and when he's in his little mindscape that's when he can talk normally and i just i continue to curse the 2007 movie for thrusting this mm-hmm. non-talking bumblebee on us in perpetuity forever uh and but you know that's just because i'm old <laughs> yeah but uh, i mean i can overlook that i can overlook optimus prime having a mouth and the rest of the show seems pretty good so uh, and I and I think it I mean it is definitely I mean I think it's a show that's made for kids to enjoy and for adults who remember the old cartoon to enjoy too and I think it does a good job of both in my opinion. Now for the counterpoint. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead Yoshi. <laughs> you assume I'm going to be negative. Why do you always assume I'm negative? I don't know. Yeah. I just <laughs> Jesus. If if the baseline is as Jeremy said, the Machinima series, then hand out the Oscars now because we got a winner. <laughs> In reality, to me, and I tried desperately hard to look at this through the eyes of an eight-year-old. Ninety percent of this is focused on Windblade and Bumblebee, and they are so. It's like they're. What's the right word? For this. The, it's like the show is so desperate to be liked that they cranked up the personality to 120%. And it's just oozing personality. for Like me, because I talk through my radio, and I'm goofy, keep transforming when I don't need to. And like me, because I can fly around, and I'm smart, and I know... It, it, I mean, it was just... It was it was way too much flash and glitz and, and, and uh, whatever the fuck word you want to insert. It, it just screamed of desperation to like me. And... Mm-hmm. You know, if I worked for a studio that was given 15 minutes, I I can't say I wouldn't do the same thing. But that doesn't mean I don't have to. I, I have to like it. I, I You know what? Okay. Compliment sandwich. I liked the soundtrack. <laughs> I hated the character personalities. I liked that the credits were simple in the end. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thin compliments. Yeah. <laughs> one, one neat thing that they did, I think it was more in episode two than episode one, but the Windblade and I think it's Thundercracker, who's the Decepticon jet we see, when they're in robot mode, you see their wings just kind of like pop in. So it's, you know, normally you, you have the, you know, the question like how do, how do these 
bots with big wings walk through a door. And it's just, just kind of a easy solution to that. The wings just pop out when they're going to, when they need them to be popped out. And I, that I shit doesn't that was, bother me. I mean, it does. I mean, like to me, both Windblade and, and Bumblebee look like toys. They don't look like yeah. cars that transform into robots. That doesn't, I mean, especially Bumblebee. I mean, he, for some reason, like as soon as I saw him do a skit, I'm like, God, those look like plastic tires. <laughs> uh, it, it it doesn't it doesn't bother me. It, what bothers me is just their desperation yeah. to be liked. Yeah, and it's it's. I, I'm uh, hoping that settles down as you get into the show. I mean, this is the first episode. Sure. Well, yeah. the se- uh, even the second episode is does they're not as amped up as the first one because Bumblebee doesn't when he's in his little mindscape thing he's talking normally so that. You know that ratchets things down a little bit. And uh, I'm also hoping that as they recover more memories, the more mature Bumblebee comes out, and not this kind of hyper kitty Bumblebee. Mm-hmm. Right. What's the uh, what's the Autobot equivalent of Ritalin? Is it Dark Energon? <laughs> hyper Energon? I don't know. Um, but I mean, it's definitely something. I think we're gonna. I don't know if we're gonna talk about it every week like we did with the Machinima stuff. We'll see if we can get Daryl to do that. But if anything, we'll we'll check up on it every few episodes. That is it for media news this week. All right. And uh, let's finish up the show with some feedback. Thanks, Charles. And if you would like to leave feedback, head on over to transmissionspodcast.com slash feedback there. You can shoot us an email. You can message us on Facebook. You can leave us a voicemail. You've got... A multitude of ways to contact us, and we couldn't make it easier for you. So head on over there and uh, tell us what you think about anything. We're all ears. And uh, first up, we're going to go to Facebook, where Joshua has left us some uh, left us a message, and he writes, "Have some feedback for the next all." Oh, well. <laughs> Joshua writes, "Charles, I'm disappointed in you. How could you not know that it's pronounced inflatable dialect? What a finicky what." What the frickety darn is an inflatable Dalek? Shame on you, Charles. Shame. In all seriousness, guys, keep up the good work. Uh, keep up the good work that you do and keep doing the all-around, keep being the all-around great guys you are. I look forward to hearing many more One, See you at TFCon Chicago. You, mis- you mispronounced my mispronunciation. <laughs> I know I did. <laughs> I, I, there's a there's a whole whole fucking swarm of Doctor Who fans headed to my house. <laughs> yeah, uh, Josh, I'm not a Whovian, so sorry. I don't. I'm not. Uh, I'm not going to apologize for not being a Whovian and not caring about Doctor Who. So <laughs> that, that's the the show about the the kids that go to school for wizards, right? Yes. <laughs> yes, it is. All right, the heat's off me. All you Whovians, go attack, go attack Jeremy. Can we talk about a real good show called Red Dwarf? Because that thing does not get enough uh, enough attention. Yeah, I'm sure our, our I'm sure our listeners in the UK can will have a chat about. Would love to have a chat about Red Dwarf. I go hide in my phone booth. <laughs> All right, next uh, we've got an email from Help Me Out, Charles. The Alleluia Haptism. Fantastic username there. Uh, That person, individual, special somebody, wrote, First off, I love your show. Been listening to you guys for a while, but my question is with the IDW hardcovers collection. I keep up on them, but I prefer to buy the collection's volumes. Are they going to put the rest of them in a phase three, or will I have to buy them in their single comics? I get them digital to keep up, but I want to know if you guys think it will be released. Uh, fuck. That's a good question. What do you think, Charles? Um, I mean, I'd probably say eventually, but it's probably going to be a while. I mean, they're, they are releasing trades of like the comic arcs, you know, the individual, uh, comics. So you don't have to buy individual issues. You can wait for the trades. But the larger collections, it'll probably be, I would say, maybe six months to a year before yeah. the collection starts showing up. Because they're still, they haven't even gotten to the end of um, R.I.D. and More Than Meets the Eye with the Phase 2 collections. So you, then you've got a whole nother two years of the, you know, Lost Light and Optimus Prime. So I mean, What I read in this was the fear that because of the whole continuity ending, but... IDW is keeping the license, so 
there's no reason why they wouldn't continue to republish the old stuff, you know, as right. they've been doing. Right. Yep. Yeah. So, I mean, if you're willing to wait, wait, I mean, but uh, it's going to be a little while. Um, if you, if you can't wait, the trades will be coming out more quickly than those collections. So mm-hmm. you can get the trades, uh, but you don't have to get the single issues. You definitely don't have to do that. So hope that helps. If it makes you feel any better, any better, buddy, we're still waiting on them to finish the UK reprints. We've been oh, waiting yeah. on that for a fucking ever. Well, I mean, maybe now James Roberts will have some time to work on that. <laughs> yeah. He's the one who's been collect, like doing all the, um, assembling all the material to get it all together since you know yeah. since it's a labor labor of love for him, and I think he's probably been busy. So hopefully, yeah. Although I think he's done writing Lost Light. I think it's done, isn't it? Like he might be back on that wagon. I, I would yeah, think so he's yeah. probably going to take a break, <laughs> but then yeah, I'm sure he'll come back and finish it. He might be working on it now, and it'll show up in December or something. Yeah, there you go. That'd be a nice surprise. Hint, hint, Mr. Roberts. <laughs> well, gentlemen, that'll end it for feedback this week. Back to you, Charles. All right, well, that will end the show. Thanks, everyone, for listening, and we will see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Thanks for listening to Transmissions. Remember, you can help support the show by donating to us directly via Patreon or PayPal. Once you become a donor, you will receive access to donor-only goodies, like donor-only contests, listening to us record transmissions live, and getting transmission swag at 20% off. You can find links for this at transmissionspodcast.com slash support. Subscribing to us on Stitcher, iTunes, and Google Play is also a great way to support us here at Transmissions. Every subscription we get helps us get better noticed on those services. Leaving us a comment and five-star review doesn't hurt either. Be sure to come chat with us on Discord. You will find a link for Discord at transmissionspodcast.com slash Discord. And of course, you can always send us an email at feedback at transmissionspodcast.com. Thank you all for listening, and we'll see you again next week. We need to drop some beats, Jeremy, so you can start singing. (laughs) More than meets the eye. Do you want me to play it again or just have Mike put it in? Oh, I guess, yeah, Mike can edit it in, can he? I'm not going to subject these people to the same clip twice. (laughs) He's not here to object, so yes, he can do it. Quattro is the shit. Quattro always hangs out with me after a show while I do the intros. Unfortunately, it's going to Canada.